All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Felix Levitsky, who is in the math department at Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, Felix has been, a, I, I would say now, like approaching longtime collaborator. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 I think we first met in 2013 at Cambridge uh, at the semester of mathematical challenges in quantum information. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And he did his PhD with uh, Nalanjana Datta, who's also a close collaborator. And um, he's worked on a variety of topics in quantum information. His PhD thesis, I believe, is titled Relative Entropies and Their Use in Quantum Information Theory. And so if you're interested in a detailed presentation of that topic, I would highly recommend his PhD thesis. Uh, Felix has visited us twice at LSU, and now we have this short virtual visit. Maybe we'll have a more normal visit, uh, but I heard today about a mu variant. Anyway, um, so uh, towards, I think in his postdoc, he started working on this topic of port-based teleportation and getting into some heavy representation theory. And um, I noticed in, I guess we see August of last year, he posted this paper to the archive, which was you know, meant to be a um, simpler explanation of many things going on with port-based teleportation. I believe the article has original contributions as well. And so I was very interested in it. And I've been bugging him, I think for about a year, <laughs> give a seminar. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the time was coming and then all of a sudden we have Hurricane Ida, right? And like, kind of like potentially through a wrench, but it seems like, you know, everyone has power and internet. So I decided we should just go forward with it. So, um, yeah, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Mark, for that very nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure giving this talk. Obviously, I would love to be there in person. Hopefully, we can make that work at some point in the future. And I'm also, I also hope that everyone has been safe during the hurricane. And I'm happy for everyone who's uh, attending today. So, as Mark said, in, uh, in, the, in recent years, I became interested in this task of port-based teleportation. And, and one reason that I'm so interested in it is because I think it's a very nice application of representation theoretic methods in quantum information. And the goal of my talk will be to uh, convince you that this is an interesting task and, and also uh, explain how these symmetries arise and how we can use them to describe the task. And, and this, this uh, theme of using symmetries is, of course, uh, ubiquitous in, in all of mathematical physics, I think, where you always try to use symmetries to simplify a problem and make it more tractable. Uh, a very nice example of this is spectrum estimation of a quantum state. So uh, in the usual scenario, we have uh, you know, an unknown quantum state rho, and we're interested in not describing it in full, meaning, uh, all we all we are interested in is the spectrum of rho or the eigenvalues of rho. So we do not care, for example, if, if this is a spectral decomposition, we do not care what the eigenvectors are. We only want to know the spectrum. And in there's an operational setting where we're given uh, identical uh, copies of that state rho, and then we're allowed to make measurements on all of these states jointly in order to guess uh, a spectrum. And then it turns out that if you look at the input on the left-hand side to this box, which measures the spectrum of the state, if you, where you have these identical and, 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 and uh, independent copies of rho, then you will see that there are certain symmetries. And so one thing, for example, is that if you're only interested in the spectrum of a state, then obviously there is a unitary symmetry because every rotated state were rotated, I mean, uh, by, by a unitary, obviously has the same spectrum. So that means that if I apply the same unitary to all of these copies of the state row, then this will not change what I'm interested in. 
And so this is now a U tensor N symmetry where this U is a, is a unitary. And on the other hand, if, if I permute the copies of these uh, state of the state row on the left hand side here, nothing changes, of course, because like these identical copies are of course invariant under permuting them. And so this means that we have this permutation symmetry here. Uh, so, so this here is a, a slightly sloppy way for me to write um, a permutation of the symmetry group acting on these different uh, spaces. I will explain in more detail later what I actually mean by this. But it's, I think it's kind of easy to see that this row tensor end state, which is the input to the spectrum estimation problem, has this permutation symmetry. Okay, And so naturally, these two symmetries are very powerful, and you will want to use them. And you can actually make that work. And, and it turns out that the optimal measurement without loss of generality can also uh, be assumed to have these symmetries. And then you can use representation theory to describe this optimal measurement. So this is what happened in these papers by Litz et al. in the 80s, and then Karl and Werner uh, slightly more recent. And I didn't choose the example of these two uh, symmetries by accident, because it turns out that these, these two symmetries are, I'm sorry, these two symmetries are, on the one hand, very common in quantum information theory. And on the other hand, mathematically, um, there's a nice relation between these two symmetries, uh, in the sense that when we have uh, an object that's symmetric under both of these uh, symmetries or actions, then there's a nice structure that we can use. And this is usually subsumed by um, so-called Shuai duality. And I will explain what this means later. And the goal of this talk is to find and exploit these symmetries in quantum interpretation protocols. And so as a reminder of what is quantum interpretation, it's, it's one of the most fundamental ideas of our field, in my opinion. And it, it, it's this idea that if you have a shared entanglement between two parties, then you can activate the shared entanglement using classical communication in order to implement the quantum channel between these two parties. And so this goes back to, to the, uh, this group of six people who described uh, what we now call standard interpretation in, in the early 90s. Okay, so this is what I'll do in the, in the talk. I will have one slide on preliminaries to kind of like set some, some terminology and notation. Then I will spend some time on, on defining the actual task of port based interpretation, which is a variant of what I just said. And uh, we will describe some of its properties and some of its useful, uh, some of its useful properties that, that will hopefully convince you uh, why we're interested in, in, in this task. And then the kind of like the, the most important part of this talk will be to, to explain and, and see how to exploit the symmetries of porpoise interpretation and how they lead to uh, a description of, of, the, of the, the quality of the porpoise interpretation protocol. And then I will spend a little bit of time and I, I will do this on, on a specific part Porpoise interpretation protocol that I call the standard protocol. And again, I will explain later what I mean by this. And then I will also spend a little bit of time explaining how we can use the same ideas to, to uh, describe fully general port precipitation protocols. And then I'll conclude. Okay. So uh, as to the preliminaries, uh, I think this is uh, a quantum crowd. So I don't have to explain what I mean by quantum states, hopefully. You're good. Uh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, just as some notation, when we talk about uh, bipartite systems, then there's a, a special class of entangled states called maximally entangled states, which uh, for qubit systems look like this. So we, we have uh, two two level systems, and then we can look at uh, the state of both of them. If you if you think about them as spins, then both of them being in the up state uh, and both of them being in a down state. And then you take an equal superposition of the two. We will more generally be talking about Q dits of local dimension D, where D is some integer. And then here um, I take the phi plus, which is now the maximally entangled state uh, of two Q dits to be this particular choice. Okay, where the where this I, uh, this collection of I vectors is some basis for the A and B systems. This is the quantum part of the, of the preliminaries. Uh, the, the representation theoretic part is that we will be talking about the unitary representations of a group. By that, I mean uh, a complex Hilbert space, finite dimensional, where uh, I have a map from the group 
G into the unitary group acting on this vector space. And this should be a group homomorphism in the sense that if I uh, take the product of two group elements and I look at the representation of the, the resulting element, this should be the product of the two uh, representations of the elements, okay? And then it follows from this also that the inverse of a group element in the representation space is given by the permission adjunct, okay? So this, this here means that we were in the unitary group of V. And this, this gives way to a rich theory uh, called representation theory. And, and one of the most fundamental uh, ingredients of this theory is that of an irreducible representation, which is a representation space that has no invariant subspaces under this representation other than the trivial ones, which are the trivial vector space and the vector space itself, okay? And so in, the, in this direct sum picture, uh, that means that for certain suitable groups, and we were only talking about these suitable groups, uh, every representation space can always be decomposed into a direct sum of these irreducible uh, representations. One, and, and we, uh, this, this, this uh, notation here means that this mu is some index that uh, kind of like labels my irreducible representations. But it can happen that in such a decomposition, I have many uh, isomorphic copies of one particular irreducible representation appearing. Okay, and so this is then, uh, we say then that this ir irreducible representation or irrep uh, occurs with a certain multiplicity. And mathematically, we can denote this in the following way where we have the, the irrep v mu appearing in this, in this direct sum decomposition. And then we can write it as a tensor product with a space that's called the multiplicity space. And so this, uh, the dimension of this multiplicity space is the number of times that irrep appears in a decomposition, okay? So I, 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 I appreciate that this is a very, very short way of uh, talking about representation theory. I hope people have seen this before. Uh, we will not use much more than what is on this slide, okay? So I hope people are, are okay with this. And please stop me at any point if, if something's unclear. It's likely that some listening have not seen this before. Just indicating. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I hope I hope the talk will be still understandable if you even if you've never seen this before. But uh, please stop me uh, if something is unclear. But for everyone who has seen linear algebra, and I think most people have, um, it, it, this is really just the decomposition of a finite dimensional vector space into uh, these direct summons, okay? And uh, we will later see that these, uh, the group kind of determines the structure of these uh, irreps here, okay? All right, so that's the preliminaries. Let's, let's get into the meat of the talk. Uh, let's first talk about teleportation. And so in order to motivate port-based teleportation, I first want to spend a little time on talking about standard teleportation as uh, introduced and, and discussed by Charlie Bennett et al. in the 90s. And again, the idea of teleportation is that two parties, Alice and Bob, are somehow separated spatially, and they want to send each other quantum information. And the resources that they can use for that is that uh, they have some shared entangled state between them, which here I denote by these uh, wiggly lines. So this will always mean a maximal entangled state in this talk. And on top of this entangled resource state, resource state that they share, they also have a classical channel. So Alice can kind of like pick up the phone and call Bob and, and, and tell him some message. And so now the task is to use these two resources, the entangled state on these uh, systems A1 and B1 and this classical channel to teleport this qubit C that Alice has to Bob. And the way that the standard protocol works and in a way, this is how every teleportation protocol works, is that first, Alice performs a measurement on all of the systems in her procession. So this is the C system that she wants to teleport, and it's the one half of this entangled state. And in a standard protocol, this is a specific measurement. This is the Bell measurement on, on, on these two qubits. And she will get a certain outcome from that uh, measurement, it's a bell measurement, meaning that she kind of like asks um, in what of, of, of the four bell states does she find her two qubits? 
So the outcome is one out of four possible outcomes. And upon sending that outcome to Bob, Bob applies a correction operation to his share of the entangled state that uh, then kind of like recreates the C system in his system. But at the same time, uh, when Alice measures her system, of course, the information of C is, is kind of like erased from here. So this is not cloned, okay? And uh, in the standard protocol, the, the Bell measurement, every like the, the four outcomes of the Bell measurement correspond to the four poly operators that Bob can then use to, to correct uh, his state so that he really gets the C system on his side, okay? So I, I didn't actually show you how it works, but these are the three steps. And then it's a, it's a very simple exercise to, to make sure that this actually always works. Okay, so uh, this is one of the advantages of standard teleportation. The, the target state, the state of this qubit C is always teleported exactly to Bob. And the other advantage is that it's actually beautifully simple. Yeah, because if you, if you do the algebra and we go through the steps, you, you realize this is a very simple thing. Uh, and it's kind of like magical that it works and it's great. Uh, so those are definitely very good things about teleportation. The one thing that is a disadvantage, especially when you, when you think about certain applications of teleportation is that Bob has to apply this correction operation here uh, in order to really uh, make the state of, uh, of this qubit appear uh, in his, uh, on, in, on his side in the system, okay? And kind of the goal is, so, and, and so this, this correction I told you uh, consists of, of Bob applying one of the four poly operators to his system. And you see that this actually prevents standard plotation from being used in certain applications because Bob can only uh, further process his, his uh, qubit once he has corrected for uh, the error from the teleportation protocol, okay? And you find that in certain applications, and one, one big example and one important example is, is this so-called instantaneous non-local corner computation, where the task is, for example, to implement a joint unitary uh, for two spatially separated parties, Alice and Bob. Uh, it turns out that, it, that in these applications, this is a problem, that you have this correction operation, okay? And so, the, the starting point for porpoise teleportation is to, to solve this problem by making the correction operation as simple as possible. And so this is the kind of the advantage of porpoise teleportation. I will, I will tell you in a minute what it actually is, but now just conceptually. Uh, the point is that we want to turn this disadvantage into, a, into an advantage by, by making the correction operation simple. But uh, this comes at a cost in a way because the two advantages of standard teleportation Kind of disappear a little bit okay so we will see that the the price you pay for making the correction simple is that you don't have exact teleportation anymore and it's also a little more complicated to talk about it okay because then we now we need these tools like representation theory to actually talk about these things but again the the, the benefit of doing this uh, the gain is that it opens up some applications which i will uh, talk about later so in more detail, how does this work? How can we make the uh, how can we make the correction simpler? And the answer is, and this this goes back to to Ishizaka and Hiroshima, who who introduced porpoise teleportation, is that we can uh, give Alice and Bob more entangled states as a resource, and then instead of applying an operation to one of these ports, we simply select one of these end ports that Bob has, okay? So the starting point is that Alice still has a system that she wants to teleport and we still call the system C. But now instead of this one entangled state between Alice and Bob, we now have N maximal entangled states, okay? And so these systems here, the AI systems on Alice's side and the BI systems on Bob's side are called the ports and this is where the name is derived from, okay? So this is why it's called port teleportation. And uh, I will also from now on actually always assume that we talk about Q dits. And for simplicity, every system that you see has the same local dimension D, okay? And now the teleportation protocol works with the same three steps. So first, Alice performs, performs a measurement on the systems in, in her possession. 
which is now n plus one systems. So it's the, the n halves of the maximally entangled states that they share plus the one cuded that they want to teleport. So n plus one. So she performs some measurement that, uh, and, and like keep in mind the measurement in teleportation is always uh, there in order to, to correlate the, the C system with the port systems. And so this will be an, ent an entangled measurement in particular. Uh, she performs that measurement, she gets an outcome from that measurement, uh, which she again communicates to Bob through the classical channel that they have access to. But now this, uh, this uh, measurement outcome is, is a, a number between one and n, and it's, it labels the port in which Bob should expect the C system, okay? So the message I labels one of these ports, and based on that label, Bob just discards everything but that i-th port. And the goal is for this i-th port to have uh, an approximate copy of the C system and therefore teleport the C system, okay? And now the crucial uh, insight for corpus teleportation is that this, this correction that Bob performs, which is really just discarding everything but one port, so performing a partial trace mathematically, that now commutes with applying any unitary to uh, the port systems before you start the port based rotation protocol, right? Because uh, it doesn't matter whether I first apply the same unitary to all the ports and then I trace everything out but one port or I do it the other way around, right? I think this is easy to see. And so therefore, instead of teleporting, let's say the, the C qubit or C qubit is, is in the state psi, if Bob applies the U unitary to all of his ports, then they actually achieve teleportation of this process state instead of the uh, initial state, okay? And the, the, the cool thing is that Bob doesn't need to know which of the ports eventually will hold the, the teleported state. Uh, he can just apply this unitary to all the port systems before, okay? And so this is uh, what's, what's called a universal programmable quantum processor, this kind of uh, 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 achieving this task here, so teleporting an arbitrary processed state. But there's a caveat now because there's a, there's a no-go theorem that was proved by Nielsen and Zhuang, which states that if, if you have finite resources in the game, which means that you have a finite number of ports and the local dimension of each of these systems is finite, then there can't be a perfect universal programmable quantum processor. And so therefore, this now means that port-based teleportation with this particular correction operation is necessarily not exact. Because if it was exact, it would violate this no theorem, okay? So this, this seems like it's a huge downside because we go from an, an exact uh, teleportation protocol to a, an approximate protocol. But it turns out that it is still useful. And we will see later why, because as you add more and more ports, the protocol actually becomes better and better. And this is kind of the way why we can deal with this approximate nature. And this, uh, on the other hand, this unitary covariance property that the correction uh, permu uh, uh, commutes with, with applying any unitary to the ports, that actually gives rise to all of these applications that uh, where port-based teleportation is useful, okay? And so one of them I mentioned before, it's this instantaneous non local quantum computation uh, where the goal is to implement joint unitaries on separate systems. Uh, and that has a, an interesting application in, in, in cryptography in something called position-based cryptography. And then since its inception, it's also been used in other tasks such as quantum channel discrimination, uh, quantum communication complexity, and uh, uh, other terms, uh, other, other tasks as well, okay? I will not be talking more about the applications of, of corporate interpretation uh, because I'm, personally, I'm, I'm just interested in the task itself, but uh, I hope this is enough motivation for people to, to uh, believe me that corporate interpretation is something useful, okay? Are there any questions so far to, to the setup of corporate interpretation? Yeah. Um... Would you mind going back to the slide where the protocol is laid out? Nice. Yeah. So this collective measurement 
that Alice has to do. You're eventually going to tell us what that is? Yes. Okay. Um, and maybe this is a question that's better reserved for the end of the talk. Um, if you wanted to implement this measurement experimentally in a quantum optics lab, is that going to be a big challenge? Yes. And I will, that is one of the open questions that I have in the last slide. I will not, I, I don't have anything to say yet, but it's something we were thinking about. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's return to that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, those are, uh, that's a very good question. And I'll, I, will, I will come back to that later. Uh, for now, I, I see this as a purely theoretical thing that is interesting. <laughs> okay. And we don't yet ask the question of how do we actually do this? Okay. Yeah. But there, there might be things to discuss. So we'll, we'll just yes. come back. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so we have introduced this task of corpus teleportation. And we, we have seen how it is different from standard teleportation by having this unitary covariance property. And since by this novel theorem by Nielsen and Chuang, we, it, we, we now have to deal with the fact that this is not a perfect protocol for, for finite resources. We now have the problem that we want to characterize how good is a purpose teleportation protocol. And one, one natural way to do this is to look at the quantum channel that it implements. Okay, so when you have this teleportation protocol where the C system is teleported into one of these ports, then the goal of purpose teleportation can be uh, reformulated as the task of approximating the identity channel from C to this BI system, which we call C prime. Okay. And uh, the better the protocol, the closer the resulting quantum channel is to the identity channel. And so this channel is, is usually called the teleportation channel. There's a formula for it that I, I didn't write down, but it's, uh, there's a way to write this down in terms of the measurement and uh, the, the entangled state. And a very good way to characterize quantum channels is using the entanglement fidelity, where you ask how much correlation with a reference system does the quantum channel preserve, okay? So uh, operationally, you input half of a maximal entangled state into the channel. The channel maps this uh, half of the entangled state to some system C prime. And then you ask how much of the correlation, how much of the initial correlation is still left in this uh, noisy version of the maximal entangled state. Okay. And if, it, and, uh, if the entanglement fidelity is one, that means that there was no noise in the process and this is actually a perfect channel. And so we will, another way of, of, of uh, measuring uh, the kind of the quality of the protocol would of course be uh, something like diamond norm, uh, measuring the diamond norm distance to the identity channel, but uh, we will be using the entanglement fidelity for this, okay? Actually, in fact, because of the unitary covariance, there is an exact relation between diamond norm and entanglement fidelity for part precipitation. So it doesn't actually matter which one you choose. And we, we just choose the entanglement fidelity. Okay, so now the goal is uh, given a measurement and an entangled state, we want to determine this entanglement fidelity. And one very useful thing, which was also an insight by Ishizaka and Hiroshima, is to realize that the entanglement fidelity of a porpoise teleportation protocol is actually directly related to a state discrimination problem. And it's, 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 it's a specific one where you take the resource state, which are these n maximal entangled states, and then you define these n states, which are called eta i here, where the eta i state uh, has the i port of Bob and everything else traced out. Okay. So, kind of the eta i state is the one system that Bob has being maximally entangled with um, the corresponding system that Alice has, and all the other systems uh, on Alice's side are just in a completely mixed state. And then it turns out that the entanglement fidelity, so this is kind of like a, an easy calculation that just uses the, the so-called transpose trick for maximally entangled states. Uh, you can prove that the entanglement fidelity of that corpus teleportation protocol is just the same thing 
or pro proportional to the success probability of distinguishing these n states uh, with uniform prior. So you assume that they're all equally probable. And then a measurement that will distinguish these states, uh, you can turn into a measurement for a porpoise interpretation protocol. And the, the proportionality uh, factor is n over d squared, where n is the number of parts and d is the local dimension. And it's actually, this, this holds even more generally when you don't have maximally entangled states as uh, these port states, but you have just some arbitrary entangled port state. Okay, so this is a very general relationship between uh, port based interpretation and a state simulation problem. And the nice thing about this, this connection is that uh, state discrimination is, uh, can be expressed as a semi-definite program. So a little more generally where you don't, you, you don't necessarily have uniform priors. So uh, it's the task of, of uh, distinguishing a collection of, of n quantum states, each coming with a prior probability pi. And so you ask uh, usually for the, the average success probability, which is this quantity here. Uh, where this here describes the, the probability of uh, correctly identifying the state A to I, and then you weigh them by the probability. And the EI here is uh, a so-called POVN, which is the most, in, in our setting, the most general definition of a quantum measurement. So th this is a collection of uh, positive semi-definite operators that sum to the identity, and each uh, measurement or effect uh, operator EI is, is uh, related to a possible outcome and therefore to, to detecting one of these states eta I. Okay. And so this is the so-called primal problem of, of state discrimination where you want to maximize the success probability over all PLBMs. And this is a so-called semi-definite program, which is a certain type of convex optimization problem that has a particularly nice duality theory. And so to this primal problem, you can formulate a dual problem, which is a minimization problem. And uh, the corresponding dual to this one here is that you have some operator K whose trace you want to minimize. And uh, you have these positive semi-definite constraints on, on this operator K. So they should be greater than, in the operator sense, uh, the weighted states PI, eta I for all I, okay? And you can also prove that in, in, in state discrimination, you always have strong duality, which means that the two problems actually have the same value. And so you can choose which one you want to solve when you want to solve the state discrimination problem. This is a very handy thing to have. And uh, by the separation co connection between purpose interpretation and state discrimination, we, we may uh, use this semi-definite programming formulation to solve purpose interpretation. Okay, so uh, as an overview, this is, this is where we are right now. We have these n ports. Uh, well, we have two n ports, uh, n ports for Alice, n ports for Bob, and we assume that they are in, in uh, these copies of maximal entangled states. And then for the state discrimination problem, we look at these states A to I, which we get from tracing out all but one system on Bob's side. And this, this should remind you of the correction operation because it is actually uh, that correction operation that you use here. So that's why we, we're looking at these particular states. And then of course, when you trace out half of a maximum entangled state, you get a completely mixed state. So the states that we want to discriminate are these uh, states A to I that consist of a maximum entangled state between one of Alice's systems and Bob's system and all the other systems on Alice's side in a maximum mixed state. And uh, the prior probabilities in the state discrimination problem are uniform. Okay. And this is the success probability that we want to maximize by, by finding a good measurement EI. And now the question is, what is a good choice for this measurement? And you can always make a pretty good guess for, these, uh, for this measurement in the state discrimination problem. And this is the so-called pretty good measurement where you define a uh, measurement in terms of the states you want to distinguish. And what you do is you take the average state. I'm not, I'm not uh, writing the probabilities here because they're all uniform. So they drop out of this, but usually you would include them if they were not uniform. Uh, you define the average state A to bar. And then uh, the measurement operators are obtained by taking the state 
and sandwiching it with the inverse square root of the, the average state. Okay, and so this square root here is also the reason why this is sometimes called the square root measurement. It's a pretty good measurement. And then you can check. It's, I think it's easy to see just from the definition that this is always a positive semi-definite operator. So the first POBM condition is satisfied. And the second one is that if you sum them up, you will get uh, uh, the support of, of, of this average state. And by restricting your Hilbert space to the support, you can then also make sure that you have this uh, normalization or, or completeness relation satisfied, okay? And the useful thing about this uh, pretty good measurement is now that it might not be optimal, but it's always pretty good in the sense that you're always within a square of the optimal success probability, okay? So the pretty good measurement always performs no worse than or like the success probability of the pretty good measurement is always no less than the square of the optimal success probability, okay? So if you don't have any good guess in a state discrimination problem, then the pretty good measurement is a pretty good guess. But the cool thing is actually that we will, we will see that it's in fact optimal in certain problems, including in port based teleportation, okay? And so uh, the motivation to, to look at the pretty good measurement initially was that you can actually prove that using this measurement, uh, porpoise teleportation becomes optimal, uh, becomes exact in the limit of n going to infinity, meaning that as you add more and more ports, the protocol becomes better and better. And in the limit, it just becomes uh, perfect in the sense that the entanglement fidelity of the resulting protocol or sequence of protocols converges to one. Okay. So the, the quantum channel becomes better and better as you add ports and ports. So we have these two things. We have the, the no-go theorem in, on the one hand that tells us for any finite number of ports, uh, we can never have an exact purpose interpretation protocol because of this unitary covariance property and the no-go theorem. But on the other hand, as we increase the number of ports, uh, that sequence actually converges to a perfect protocol. But now the, the, the natural question is to ask, is the pretty good measurement also the optimal measurement for any finite number of ports? And the answer is yes. And that's the main result of uh, my paper and two papers that proved this before me, kind of like implicitly. Uh, the pretty good measurement is in fact the optimal measurement. And I want to show you how we can prove this in the next part, okay? So this is now on symmetries of standard uh, porpoise rotation. But before I start that, uh, are there any questions on, on what happened so far? Okay. You're still with me though, right? We're still with you. Yeah. yeah right. um, is there a simple, I mean, your, your paper does this, but is there kind of a simple intuition why the PGM is optimal? Is it because we're in a situation where there's so much symmetry that there's like a collapse somehow? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, that might be like way too the, simple. It's a good question. It's like so much symmetry, right? And that's, it is, that's it is related like, to the symmetries, yes. Uh, that, that's so, what you're exploiting all throughout your paper. Right. Um, is, is there like a general way to decide if in a given set of, a given situation, whether the pretty good measurement will be optimal? That's a very good question. Uh, there are certain uh, examples or kind of situations where you can prove that the pretty good measurement is optimal. That's, um, I can send you the references for that. I don't know them off the top of my head, but there's a, a group of people who looked at these things mm -hmm. and it, it is all, it's always uh, settings where you have some kind of symmetry mm -hmm. uh, in the states. So, for example, when uh, the set of states you want to distinguish forms an orbit under a certain action of a group, uh, and then there's an, uh, another technical condition. But in this situation, and we will have this, I will show this later, uh, in those situations, a pretty good measurement, for example, is optimal. Okay. So it's always a certain symmetric. Uh, a certain symmetry that, that, that makes the pretty good measurement optimal. 
Okay. But I, I realize this is a somewhat uh, unsatisfying answer. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. But I mean, it, yeah, it's a challenging question, I think. It is. And it's, and it, there's no, there's no general answer, I think. Okay. Uh, perhaps I can ask a question at this point, which from mm -hmm. the start has been sort of um, at the back of the mind. You started by saying that knowing the spectrum, of course, you don't have the full information about the state, but you're considered symmetry and permutation. Now, I'm trying to link it to these things called isospectral transformations. So if you know the spectrum of a Hamiltonian, there you, you still can't, that's the famous inverse problem. So mm -hmm. you don't know what, for instance, the Hamiltonian actually, what the potential itself is in ordinary terms, say in the quantum mechanical system. Now that can be very subtle because you can construct a potential which looks completely different almost, but it differs in only one eigenvalue out of even an infinity being different. Mm -hmm. so, so if you know the spectrum or you don't sort of know the spectrum, you almost know everything about the spectrum, but you missed one eigenvalue, then it can be a very different. Also, you can have the same spectrum and different potentials which can give you that. I, I, I agree. I think I know what you mean. And, and the, when I said in the beginning, like when you, when you want to know the spectrum of, of, a, of a state and you're in this, in this setting where you're given these n identical copies of mm -hmm. the state, mm -hmm. and then you have these symmetries and the optimal measurement uh, will, will uh, respect these symmetries. The way I, I use the word optimal there is in a very specific sense, mm -hmm. and it might actually not be good at, at uh, making sure I don't run into the problem that you're just saying, that where one of the eigenvalues I get wrong. So this might not always, it might not be the optimal, well, uh -huh. it might not be the best choice of, of measurement, depending on what you want to, want to know. Okay. Uh, because uh, there is actually, there's some very sophisticated mathematics called Darbu transformations, you may know about it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which come in in that discussion. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, we will we will not be concerned with with those questions. Okay. Uh, okay. But I I I think I, I understood the point that you that you were making. Okay. That Good. yeah yeah. Thanks. Uh, let me continue. Uh, I'm I see that there's like 50 minutes left. What's the what's the policy on overshooting in this seminar? I mean, um, the, make sure to. I personally am super interested in your talk. Um, <laughs> and I don't, I don't know how many super interested people you have here, but um, you know, one way we could proceed is that if you think you'll be like 20, 25 more minutes, that would probably be fine. That definitely works. So I'm, I'm kind of like two thirds into the talk and I will definitely be able to finish the, the discussion on just the standard case where right. we have these maximum entangled states, but it, it has all the important ideas. So Great. I think I think it should be fine if I just keep and going. There, there, there's probably going to be a discussion afterwards. You know, I, don't, I don't know how much time you have. Um, I can stay for a little afterwards as well. Yeah. Okay. Because I've written down like probably seven questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, let me let me try to go through the to, through the next section and make sure that I finish this by uh, four p.m. and then we can we can we can focus on some specific points and questions. That's great. Okay, great. All right. Okay. So yeah. So this is but this is now kind of like the most important part of the talk, uh, which is on the symmetries and how we can use them to to determine this entanglement value. And the starting point is is a very fundamental observation that uh, there's this fundamental unitary symmetry that the maximally entangled state has. Meaning that uh, if you have a maximal entangled state, this bipartite state, I, you can apply any unitary on A and applying the complex conjugate on, uh, sorry, the emission conjugate on B will leave the state invariant. Okay, and you can prove this using this uh, transpose trick that I mentioned before. And Sorry, that's, because, that's actually the complex conjugate, right? That's you, you conjugate, not, not Hermitian. Uh, sorry, yeah, this is the, the component uh, wise complex conjugate. Yeah, uh, I had it right the first time. Exactly. But you're now in a math department, so star means dagger. <laughs> All right, sorry. 
Yes. So, well, I actually, I still do the physics thing where I use the dagger and, and this instead of star and bar. Uh, so by this, I mean the, the component or the entry-wise complex conjugate of the U term. Okay. So some people denote this by U bar. Okay. So I hope everyone's on board with, with the notation. Um, so we have this, we have the symmetry for any unitary U acting on, on these d-dimensional uh, systems A and B. And remember that our state ensemble is, are these eta states, which consists of a maximal entangled state on AI and BI and the completely mixed state on all the other A systems. And of course, these completely mixed states also have uh, a unitary symmetry trivially somehow, right? Because they're multiples of the identity. And so therefore, if I apply the same unitary on all of the A systems and I apply the complex conjugate on the B system, then this will leave all of these eta states invariant, right? On the maximal entangled state, I use this symmetry here. And on, the, uh, on these parts here, on the, on the rest of the A systems, it's just kind of like trivial because here the states are just multiples of the identity. So this is one symmetry that we have, okay? So we have a U tensor N, tensor U star symmetry. And here, this tensor product, the big one here is always uh, the AB split, okay? So these are the A systems and uh, this is the, the B system. Not everywhere though, uh, because we have a different symmetry where we can permute the N minus one A systems that are in a completely mixed state and we will not change anything on this in the state as well, right? So on these uh, n minus one systems that are not entangled with Bob, I have a permutation symmetry, and since I have n minus one factors, I have an s n minus one invariance. Okay. And so here, uh, so apologies that I'm mixing tensor products here. Here, the tensor product is is different from the one here, because here I group now the n minus one a systems on this side and the AI and BI system on this side, okay? But I can apply any permutation on the N minus one systems here. I will not change the state. So uh, the ith state commutes with um, this action on uh, these N minus one A systems of the, symmetry, of the symmetry group, okay? So these are 40, and, and this is a little bit annoying because like for different I states, we talk about uh, the group acting on different subsets of the systems, okay? So this is something to, to keep in mind. However, it becomes a little bit nicer when you look at the average state, which, you know, is just like summing up all of these A to I states. And here now we again have the same U tensor N tensor U star symmetry because each of these summons has it and, and these representations are of course linear. So a sum of these invariant states will still be invariant. But now the, the, the nice thing is that because we sum over all of these uh, A to I states and in each of these summons, the B is entangled with a different A system. If I now permute the N A systems in any way, I will actually leave the average state invariant, right? So here we really have uh, a full SN symmetry of the average state where the SN group acts by permuting these N A systems. Okay, so this is a different permutation symmetry from the one before, that's important. The unitary symmetry is again, is, is still the same thing. Okay, we have a unitary U applied to every A system and it's complex conjugate applied to the B system. And of course, uh, here, technically, I have like different B systems, but I, I, of course, always identify them, okay? So all of these B systems are just isomorphic to some system that we call B, so that we can talk about these representations here, okay? Okay, so I've talked about these representations. Let's, let's uh, introduce them in, in a slightly more formal way. So I'm talking about representations of the unitary group and the symmetric group on a specific representation space, and this is the tensor product of n d-dimensional Hilbert spaces. Okay, so I have n copies of a d-dimensional Hilbert space 
which I can take to be C D. And then I have these two actions by, of, of these two groups. First, I have the symmetric group acting by permuting uh, the different tensor factors. And one way to define this is that you can define it on product states and then use linear extension. And uh, you will just permute kind of like the, the, the indices of these uh, product states according to the permutation pi. And in order to make this a representation in a sense that I wrote down in the preliminaries, you need to include the inverse of the permutation here and not the permutation itself. It's a little bit of an annoying thing, but that's just the way it is. Uh, that's the first group action. And the second group that acts on, on, these, uh, on this tensor space is the unitary group. And we take the so-called diagonal action where we apply the same unitary to each of the systems. So again, you can define this on product states and then use linear extension to define it on the whole space. And I, I try to draw this graphically here. And I hope it's already kind of clear from this picture that the two actions commute, right? So it doesn't matter whether I first commute the tensor factors and then I apply the same unitary to each of them, or I first apply the unitary and then I commute I uh, permute the, the tensor factors, right? So these two representations commute with each other, but something stronger is actually true here. They span each other's commutant. And that is uh, to say that if I have an operator that commutes with all unitaries acting in this way, then it will actually be a, a linear combination of these uh, permutation operators and vice versa. If something commutes with every permutation, I can write it as a, a, a linear combination or an integral over uh, unitaries acting in this way, okay? And so this is what it means to span each other's commutant. And then uh, Shuwai duality relates, uh, uses that, that fact that they span each other's commutant to uh, arrive at a nice decomposition of, of this representation space into the irreducible representations of Sn and the unitary group, sorry. And this is a, a classical result from representation theory uh, that we know what these irreps look like. And they're indexed. So as, as a reminder, an irreducible representation is, is a space that doesn't contain any non-trivial subspaces that are invariant under the group action. So they're kind of like building blocks uh, when you want to decompose an arbitrary representation into, into direct summons. And it turns out that for the symmetric group and the unitary group, these irreps are in one-to-one -one correspondence with so-called Young diagrams, which is a graphical way of uh, writing down a partition of, uh, of an integer. And what's more is that we take a partition of the integer n, for n is number of copies. And we consider a partition into at most d parts where d is the local dimension of the space. And so for example, if I have uh, n equal to 12, d equal to four, then five, three, three, one would be a, a possible partition. And the corresponding Young diagram is an arrangement of boxes where each row has as many boxes as you, as you, uh, at that particular uh, part of the partition, okay? So we have, five boxes in the first row, three boxes in the, in, the, in the second one, three boxes in the third one, one box in the, in the last one. And when I say partition here, I always mean that they are ordered or, or non-increasing, meaning that I never have uh, a strictly increasing row length in these Young diagrams, okay? So I can have uh, rows of equal length like here, but the third row would not be allowed to have four boxes if the second row has three boxes, okay? And the set of all such partitions or Young diagrams uh, is an index set for the, 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 the irreducible representations. And there's actually a way to construct them using this, this data. I will not go into that here. Uh, and we, we, we know what these, these uh, representation spaces or modules look like for, for the symmetric group, they're called Specht modules and usually denote a W mu. 
And we also know the dimension of these uh, irreps. And uh, I will obviously note the dimension of this of the irreps for Sn d mu. And for the unitary group, the irreps are called wild modules. Uh, there's one actually for, for, for different uh, Ds, they, they will look different. So, so I have to include the D here in the, in the parameterization. And the dimension of the while module I call M D mu. Okay. And there's, again, for both things, there are formulas, how to compute them, uh, but this is not important for us. And now Shuai duality says that the representation space C D tensor N, decomposes into uh, a sum of these irreps. And the fact that the two groups span each other's coviton now means that each summand has uh, this tensor structure, remember? Uh, for example, from the viewpoint of the unitary group, this is the, the uh, irrep of the unitary group. So the unitary group acts only on this part. And then I said that, uh, these irreps can appear multiple times. So I have a certain multiplicity space that, uh, uh, so that uh, I can write the summand as a tensor product of the irrep times this multiplicity space. And this fact that they span each other's commutant now means that the, the irreps of these groups are each other's multiplicity spaces. So in each summand, the unitary group only acts here and its multiplicity space is the irreb of the symmetric group. And the symmetric group only acts here. And the multiplicity space of the, of the symmetric group is the irreb of the unitary group. Okay, so there's this, you can pair off uh, these um, irreps. And <clears throat> this gives you a nice structure of the representation space. And now the, the, the main tool in representation theory, at least in most of the applications in quantum information theory, is something called Schur's lemma which tells you that if some state on this representation space is invariant under both the, the action by the symmetric group and the action by the unitary group, then it actually is diagonal with respect to this decomposition, okay? So the fact that it's invariant under both of these uh, groups means that in these spaces, it can only be a multiple of the identity. And then that uh, proportionality factor, which are now the eigenvalues of rho, if you, if you look at this equation, is that's the only degree of freedom that's left, okay? So uh, an arbitrary state has a very simple form once you have the invariance under these two group actions, okay? And of course, because we talk about a state that's positive semi-definite and normalized, this translates to these two properties of these R mu uh, coefficients here. Okay, so they, they're all non-negative. That's the positive semi-definiteness. And the, the trace of rho is one. And if you take the trace within these summons here, you of course pick up the dimensions here so that uh, the sum of these products here needs to be one where you sum over all Young diagrams. Okay. And the idea is now uh, to use Shuai duality but there's one last ingredient that we need from representation theory, which is that if you've paid attention before, we don't just have the unitary symmetry in the form of this U tensor N, we have this U star uh, symmetry as well, okay? This is uh, what's called the dual representation. And so we have a tensor product of, of uh, this diagonal action with this dual representation. And there's a way to incorporate that into Schuwald decomposition, and this is called the Pieri rule, uh, where this tensor product of the dual representation with these irreducible representations translates into a certain operation on the Young diagrams where uh, you remove one box such that the remaining thing is still a Young diagram so that uh, the length of the rows is still non-increasing. And then the resulting representation decomposes again into irreps and, and all, of the, all of the Young diagrams where you can remove a box uh, will appear in this decomposition, okay? And 
if we now look at the average state eta bar in the state discrimination problem, we notice that this eta bar state has the two symmetries. It has the permutation symmetry and, and it has this unitary symmetry. Then we can now use Schur's lemma to uh, conclude that this eta bar has a, a block diagonal form where in each of these summons, uh, it's a multiple of that entity. And, and the only thing left to determine are these, these uh, constants S mu alpha here, okay? And I have now two Young diagrams in the sum because I have this process where I take a, sum, a Young diagram and I remove one box, okay? Or alternatively, you can start with uh, the Young diagram that you get in the end, and you can add one box in, in the term in the places where it's allowed. Okay. And so this is what I mean by the sum here. You start with a young diagram on n minus one boxes, and then you look at all of all those young diagrams that you obtain from adding a box in the allowed places. Okay. And the idea is now to use this block diagonal form of these states in order to compute the entanglement fidelity. And as an ansatz, you make this, you make the ansatz of the pretty good measurement. So you have uh, the measurement operators in this particular form. Uh, so you have, we have these average states and their inverse square root, and we have these eta i states. And then we use the fact, and this, this is what I've, I've written down here in blue. We use the fact that from the symmetries, we have these nice uh, block diagonal forms for uh, the average state and for the A to I state, uh, at least part of the state can be written in this block diagonal form. Okay, basically the part is completely mixed if you, if you think back to the definition of the A to I. I, I have it here. Yeah. So and, a quick question, um, sure. because for the A to bar, you have this block diagonal form, it's easy to compute inverse square root? Yes. Exactly. Right. And so that, so that like helps the calculation immensely, right? Yeah, because you basically get to just take uh, the inverse square root of these numbers here instead of yeah. the, the whole, exactly. So that's one, that's one thing you do. You just need to make sure that they're non-zero mm -hmm. so that you can divide by them, but then that's fine because remember we, uh, we restrict everything to the support of, yeah. the, of the data bar, so that's fine. Uh, exactly, and that's one of the things you use in order to evaluate this success probability, okay? So you have these, you take the trace of uh, EI and eta I, and then inserting this. So this is not just a product of these things for which you have this nice block structure. And then, so this is kind of like the technical part of my paper where you now just make sure that you, you do this in the right way and you use like, you make sure that these, uh, you know, you, you need to evaluate products of these things and taking traces, and then it turns out that the result is, is a, a formula that is just phrased in terms of the dimensions of these irrefs. And that's kind of like the beauty of, 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 of all of this. Uh, so you arrive at the end that the success probability is given by this formula here. And see, like the two sums here are exactly the two sums that appear in this block structure. And uh, what you do is you sum up this um, function of the dimensions of the irreps of the symmetric group, that's this number here, d mu, and the error of the unitary group, m d mu, okay? And so this is a formula that was, that was first proved in a paper by Michal Sutinsky, uh, 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 Sergei Strelchuk, Michal Hordetsky, and Marek Mojimas, if I pronounce his name right. Uh, but, in that paper, they had not yet observed that this is actually the optimal such uh, success probability. And uh, this, is, this is kind of what I make explicit in my paper. So we have now just evaluated the success probability of using the pretty good measurement. Okay, and we get a certain answer, but we now want to make sure that it's actually optimal. And the nice thing about this is, and that's, this is a reason why we work in the state discrimination picture is we can now use STP duality to prove optimality. And that's very nice, okay? And to prove that this expression here is optimal, we can actually just guess 
a uh, solution, a feasible solution for the dual problem. And if we find that it gives the same value, then we automatically know that it's the optimal value because we have an upper bound on the on this on this feasible solution and the two coincide okay and for evaluating this this feasible point in the dual we again use the symmetries so we now make an ansatz for this k operator here and if you if you look at it, it it's it's very much related to what we computed before it's kind of like taking the trace of this is just the same as evaluating the the success probability uh, and now you you need to do a little more because now you need to show this operator inequality. But you can again use the block structure of these things to uh, just derive that. And that's, that's the second part of the proof in the paper. And then you will find that this answer that we got for the success probability is actually also a feasible solution in the dual. And then therefore everything collapses and this is the optimal answer in the problem, okay? So and just to clarify, oh, sorry. Oh, no, yeah, that's that's it. That's the that's kind of the proof for this particular purpose irritation protocol. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. So just to clarify, <clears throat> excuse me, this choice of k is not generically dual feasible, but you need the the symmetry structure to show that. Uh, yes. I mean, you need to you need to make sure that this condition here is satisfied, right? Yeah. And uh, it's not obvious how to show that generically for this choice. No, this, and, and this is not true in general. Okay. Uh, because at that, if that was always true, then that would mean the pretty good measurement is always optimal. And we know that's not the case, I think. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. But there could be other, like, it could be interesting to find other generic choices of K that would give you like an upper bound on the success probability, right? Yes, yes, I agree. That would be, I mean, it's it's a little hard to do that. I mean, one one uh, trivial choice is to take K to be the sum of these. Oh, uh -huh. That's but that gives you an upper bound of one, yeah. which is not interesting <laughs> because you know that it's gonna be upper bounded by one. Right. Uh, and kind of like the, the task is to find a better upper bound and here, using the, the special structure of all of these these operators here, you can actually make it like work it out that this is satisfied for all i. Yeah. And then that, that gives you immediately uh, optimality of the pretty good measurement. And in a way, whenever you have a state discrimination problem where the pretty good measurement is optimal, you should always be able to do that. Mm. Yeah. Right? So this is kind of a... a yeah, it's a sufficient condition for the pretty good measurement to be optimal to have this be right. satisfied, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I sorry, I, I've been looking at the clock and it's like ten past. Um. So this this kind of concludes the kind of the main part of the of the talk. Um. I can, if if people are still interested, I can say like a couple of words to the general uh case. Will only take like two or three minutes. Uh, is that okay? That sounds good, but we should keep in mind wrapping up because it'd be nice to have a little discussion, you know? Right, right, yeah. So let me let me just quickly say, uh, maybe not even go into details. So, so far I've been I've been only talking about this case where these these port systems are just maximally entangled with each other. But the, the very nice thing about port based interpretation is even if you start with a completely arbitrary port state, then you can always, without loss of generality, assume that you have the same symmetries. And the way to do this, and this is what, what Christian Mayans did in his PhD thesis, and then we also have a, a discussion of this in our paper, is that whenever you have an arbitrary purpose interpretation protocol, you can symmetrize it to one whose entanglement fidelity is at least as good as the one you started with. Okay, so you might as well impose these symmetries. And then the nice thing is that actually, if you don't constrain yourself to maximally entangled states, then interestingly, you get better protocols. So the asymptotic behavior of uh, the standard protocol that I've been talking about so far is uh, it goes like one minus uh, one over n. So, so the one over n is kind of like the first order uh, uh, in n with which you have the convergence. 
And when you optimize over the, uh, the entangled state you started with, it turns out there's a better one that actually gives you a better scalar. So here you have conversions with one minus one over n squared. So this might be interesting in applications. And it's actually also interesting if you think about it that the maximum entangled state is not the optimal uh, purpose of rotation protocol. What's interesting is that, uh, so you can you, you kind of have like the same symmetries in the, in the picture again. And uh, there's a way to, to kind of like characterize this arbitrary port state by having some operator O acting on, on the A systems. And then you can use the symmetries to, to infer uh, also a, symmet a, a symmetric structure of this O operator. And then uh, you can do the whole thing again. And what's interesting is that, again, a pretty good measurement is optimal here. And it's actually the exact same one that we used before. So you, so you, have, you have the same kind of like a similar uh, state estimation problem again here, where you have these A to I states, only now on the A parts, you have this operator O acting, which kind of parameter parameterizes your, your arbitrary port state. But you should not actually try to distinguish those states. You should just forget the O operator and distinguish the states that we had before. And it turns out that this measurement is in fact, again, the optimal one, which is a little bit surprising. And then uh, you, you, you basically go through the same proof, which is slightly more complicated because of the O operator. And then you have this uh, expression for the entangled fidelity that you get where you, uh, it has the same form, but now you have these C mu coefficients. And the C mu coefficients are basically the eigenvalues of this O operator. And in order to find the best entangled fidelity or the best port with separation protocol, you try to maximize these uh, CMU coefficients. Okay. So this is now an optimization problem. But uh, I don't want to say more to that. So let me just conclude. We talked about port based teleportation uh, and that it's a, an approximate teleportation scheme, which has this interesting property called unitary covariance, which, which enables some applications. And the nice thing from a mathematical point of view is that porpoise interpretation has nice symmetries that enable us to, to determine the entanglement fidelity of the teleportation channels that, that we get from these porpoise rotation protocols. And uh, because of the symmetries, we can use representation theory in these proofs. And then, uh, yeah, let me just stop at this point and, and I'm happy to, to talk uh, and, and, and answer some questions, thanks. All right, great. That was a beautiful talk. Um, Thanks, let me let me hit stop recording. Uh, thank you, Phil. <laughs>